one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will never hear the recording a second time. Hello. How can I join the library? Well, you need to make an application. Would you like to do it now? Yes, if I can. One moment, and I'll get the form. Now, I just need to ask you a few questions before you sign at the bottom. Okay. Your full name, please. Angela Mary Price. Price. Yes, that's right. Okay, and your address? Apartment three, eighty-six Bridge Street, Pimlico. Bridge Street. That's just near here, isn't it? Yes, not very far. Good. So the postcode must be two o six five, right? Yes, that's right. Now your telephone number. I need both home and work if you have them. My home number is eight seven six three five one four two, and work. Is eight four five six one three zero seven. Do you need anything else, like ID or something? Yes, your driver's license will do if you have one. Right, it's easy to remember. I know it by heart. Four zero four zero A C. I'm afraid I'll also need to see it. Okay, here it is. Thanks. And your date of birth, please. Twenty four March nineteen eighty one. Okay, thanks. That's the most important part completed. But if you don't mind, I'd also like to ask you a few questions for a survey we're conducting. Yes, that's okay. Now you have some time to read questions six to ten. As the conversation continues, answer questions six to ten. What kind of books do you like to read? Here's a list to look at. Oh, it varies from time to time, but I always like to relax and learn about other countries I might visit one day. I don't like anything too heavy or serious, unless it's about animals or the environment. I'm not really into sport very much. Anything else? Well, I do like entertaining at home. You know, dinner parties. So I suppose you'll have something for me in that line. The pictures in those books always make me hungry, although they never seem to turn out exactly as they look in the books. Fine. I think that's all I need now. Except I need you to sign here on the application form. Oh, and I almost forgot. The membership fee is twenty dollars, which is refundable if you no longer stay a member. There you are. Do I sign at the bottom here? Yes, that's right. You can borrow books now if you wish, although your membership card won't be ready until next week. So if you want to borrow today, you can pick up your card when you return your first books. That's if you want to take some now. I think I will, but I'll have a look around first. Okay, take your time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this short talk on the subject of fireworks. Now, fireworks, as I'm sure many of you know, were invented in China, though there has long been disagreement as to exactly when, or even in which century. The consensus nowadays, though, is that it was in the sixth, as there is considerable evidence of war rockets being made then. We also know that fireworks were in use by the seventh century in Arabia, where they were called Chinese arrows, reflecting their military potential. It then took a long time for them to spread to Europe. In fact, it wasn't until the 1200s that fireworks made their appearance there. The basic ingredients of fireworks have changed little to this day. Their explosive capacity comes mainly from black powder, also known as gunpowder, which is produced from a mixture of charcoal, sulphur, and potassium nitrate. A modern aerial firework, the kind used nowadays in big public displays, not the small rocket type that you might remember from your childhood, is normally made in the form of a shell, often a sphere about the size of a peach. Inside the shell are a number of stars, surrounded by black powder, and running through the centre of the round shell is a charge that makes the firework explode when it reaches the desired altitude. This is known as the bursting charge. When this explodes, it ignites the outside of the stars, which begin to burn with bright showers of sparks. Since the explosion throws the stars in all directions, you get the huge sphere of sparkling light that is so familiar at firework displays. A shell of this kind is launched from a 75mm diameter mortar, which in some ways resembles the type used by the military. The mortar is a steel, or increasingly for safety reasons, shatterproof plastic pipe. This is likely to be 500mm long and sealed at one end. The other end is aimed at the sky, and at the bottom of the pipe, below the shell, is placed a cylinder containing black powder. This has a long fuse, which projects out of the tube. When this is lit, it quickly burns down to the lifting charge, which explodes to launch the shell. In so doing, it also lights the shell's fuse. The shell's fuse burns while the shell rises to its correct altitude, and then ignites the bursting charge so it explodes. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. More complicated shells are divided into sections and burst in two or three phases. Shells like this are called multi-break shells. They may contain stars of different colours and compositions to create softer or brighter light, more or less sparks, etc. Some shells contain explosives designed to crackle in the sky, or whistles that explode outward with the stars. The sections of a multi-break shell are ignited by different fuses, and the bursting of one section ignites the next. The shells must be assembled in such a way that each section explodes in sequence to produce a distinct, separate effect. The pattern that an aerial shell paints in the sky depends on the arrangement of stars inside the shell. For example, if the stars are equally spaced in a circle, with black powder inside the circle, you will see an aerial display of smaller star explosions equally spaced in a circle. To create a specific figure in the sky, for instance a heart shape, you create an outline of the figure in stars inside the shell. Then you place explosive charges inside those stars to blow them outward into the shape of a large heart. Each charge has to be ignited at exactly the right time, or the whole thing is spoiled. 
Many other shapes have particular names, like the willow. This is formed by stars that fall in the shape of willow tree branches, spreading a little to the side and then downwards. The high charcoal composition of the stars makes them long burning, so they may even stay visible until they hit the ground. The ring shell is fairly basic. It is produced by stars exploding outwards to produce a symmetrical ring of coloured lights. More complex is the pattern created by the palm, which contains large comets, or charges, in the shape of a solid cylinder. These travel outwards, explode and then curve downwards, like the limbs of a palm tree. The serpentine, the last one for now, is different again. When this one bursts, it sends small tubes of incendiaries scattering outwards in random paths, which may culminate in exploding stars. It can be quite spectacular. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear an interview with Professor Green from a local university which enrolls a large number of overseas students in its courses. He is talking to Indra, a student representative about the importance of attending lectures. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good afternoon, Professor Green. Thank you for your time today. I wonder if you could explain why you think it is important for us to attend lectures in a course that we are studying. Well, despite the increasing dependence on online communication these days, I do think it is important. Apart from delivering the content of the lecture itself, I believe that there are some general communication benefits from having large groups of students together in one place. For lecturers, it is an opportunity for us to address many students together at one time. For students, it helps you to feel part of the wider learning community who are following the course. You can interact with each other both before and after the lecture to discuss the ideas and content networking with each other and comparing your notes. But isn't most of this achieved, as you said, these days through online communication? Well, lecturers do communicate with students online, of course, but we usually only give a summary or notes of the lecture, so there are significant differences. When you go to lectures, you get more of an insight into what the lecturer considers important. We give additional commentary and anecdotes, and by voice emphasis, we can alert you to the key concepts, theories and issues of the subject. By not attending lectures, you might miss crucial information about what we are expecting in an assignment. You know, these extra things can make a difference. OK, but there are tutorials. There is a lot of interaction between students and lecturers in tutorials. Can't all this be done in tutorial discussion groups instead of having lectures? Yes, to some extent. But during lectures, the lecturers can sensitise you to the debates and the controversies that are dealt with in the literature. This can help you think more critically about the subject. So then, when you come to the tutorial, you'll be able to come with some questions and ideas for discussion. 
The result of this is that the tutorial class will be more beneficial for everyone who attends. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. I see your point. However, surely this also depends on whether students are able to understand and follow the lecture well. What strategies do you recommend to help students get the most out of lectures? I would say that first of all, it is important to do some pre-reading. By doing this, you get an orientation to the topic. You'll become familiar with the key terms and you'll be able to follow the lecture points more easily. I also think it is good to arrive early to collect handouts and to find a seat where it is easy to see and hear what is going on. Then, importantly, during the lecture itself, you need to be attentive. I know from experience that it is often difficult to be attentive. What can students do to improve their attentiveness during the lecture? I think that there are two keys to following a lecture successfully, using the visual cues and using active listening techniques. By maintaining eye contact with the lecturer and following how the lecturer makes use of the slides, whiteboard and so on, you are using the lecturer's visual cues which help make the structure of the information clear and give you a sense of what's important. Then, using active listing techniques will also help you to process the information. What do you mean by active listening techniques? Well, you need to pay attention to the methods the lecturer uses to highlight important information. As I said before, in the spoken language of a lecture, we get the benefit of things such as stress and intonation. Use of examples and anecdotes, as well as the language signals used to show relationships between ideas. Yes, I see what you mean. These things will be missing in written summaries. And what about taking notes? Does that help? Taking notes helps you to concentrate, so I would certainly advise you to do that. It's difficult to listen and write good notes at the same time, so it does take some training. Yes, taking notes needs a lot of practice, I've found. Do you have any other advice? Well, I can't finish without stressing the importance of formulating questions while you are listening. During the lecture, you should ask yourself questions about the content of the lecture and the points you are following. Ask questions like, what are the benefits or problems? What other examples are there? How does it work? Why does this happen? This will keep you focused and actively engaged in the content of the lecture. Professor Green, thank you very much for your valuable tips and your time today. You are very welcome. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4 You are going to hear a lecture about dorm rooms. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen to the tape and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to your new home for the upcoming year. These dorm rooms are among the best in the nation and are the newest ones at this school. So I hope you will all learn to appreciate them and take good care of all the facilities here. I am Gina, and I will be residential advisor in this building for the year. Today I am going to tell you about some of the programs and facilities that are available to you. I will also be telling you the rules that everyone is expected to abide by. I will be asking you to give me your full attention for the next few minutes. I will first tell you about the facilities that are available to you. The dining facility is located on the first floor of the building. It is open seven days a week from 7 a.m. to midnight. All the food offered to students is freshly made every day, and my own opinion is that the food is actually quite good. Feel free to come and grab a banana for breakfast, or sit down with a group of friends for dinner. Although your meals are served buffet style, please do not waste food. All students are expected to clean their own tables after meals. In the basement of this building, there is a gym and recreational hall. The gym has workout equipment such as treadmills and weight sets. In the recreational hall, there are ping pong tables and a pool table for student use. You must sign in when using this equipment and you will be held responsible for any damages or losses. The gym and recreational hall are open daily from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. There is a kitchen located on the second floor of this building. Your dorm key will open this door. Inside there is a refrigerator, a microwave, an oven, and a stove. This room is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you decide to cook a meal, please be considerate to all the students and clean up after yourself. You can use some food in here, but please do not make a mess. Some students do end up having their food eaten from the fridge, so be careful. Don't leave anything that looks like it tastes really good. Do not leave pots and pans lying around in the kitchen. Please store these in your room. There are many programs being sponsored by our building this year. One of the most popular is our Saturday morning outings. In the past years, these trips have included going fishing, hiking, cycling, ice skating, and even going to the beach. There will be a listing of schedule events coming out soon. The university sponsors these trips, so transportation will be provided. However, there are usually some costs associated, though they are usually minimal. Our building also has a volleyball team, all students who live in this building are welcome to join. Last year we won first place in the dorm league. Please sign up at the front desk if you are interested as soon as possible, as there are only 20 spaces available, based on a first-come, first-serve rule. The last things I want to talk about are the rules of our building. I know rules can be boring, but they are necessary to ensure the welfare of everyone living here. First, noise levels must be kept to a minimum after 11 p.m. Many students have early classes, so for those of you that have the luxury of sleeping until 10, please don't stay up late making lots of noise. Secondly, all visitors must sign in at the front door. Even if you have friends that are regular visitors, they must still always sign in. This rule is to prevent theft and robbery from occurring. Thirdly, alcohol and drugs are not permitted in this dorm in any place or at any time. Lastly, just be safe and have a great time. University is the greatest time of your life, so make the most of it. Thank you all for your attention. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.